the outfit leading us, Mike and Annie Ball. When I was in the fifth grade, I had moved over to Dennis Chavez Elementary School. This school right here where our church meets. And anytime you go to a new school, it's always a time of a little bit of anxiety. Kids are getting ready to go back to school. They've got new teachers and new classes and new friends. And some teachers have strategically split up children. They're no longer in the same class, even though they're in the next grade. They have moved those kids out of different rooms together. And I remember trying to find my place in school, coming to a new school at Dennis Chavez. It's hard enough being a young kid, middle school, high school, trying to find out your own identity. Now, put that identity into a context of a ton of other children who are trying to figure that all out. And you want to know where do you fit. And as a kid in elementary school, I loved sports. I loved playing sports. It didn't matter what the sport was, kickball, baseball, basketball, football. If we were going to have any kind of competition with my friends, I was in. What a paper throwing contest, spitting contest, what could it be? It didn't matter to me. And so I loved playing sports. I came to school and nobody knew about the incredible athlete that I was as a 62-pound fifth grader, right? And I remember going out to the grass field that was not grass at the time. Goat heads were out there. There were some stickers out there. And there was a backdrop for a kickball game. And they picked teammates. And I got picked last. I remember watching every other kid pick. I'm like, I'm definitely a better athlete than that kid right there. That's a girl. I'm better than a girl. I know I'm better than a girl, right? And that's my mindset as a kid, okay? And I felt that way, and I didn't get picked. I remember thinking, gosh, couldn't somebody just recognize me for my gifts and my talents? Well, last week, we left off, and we talked about deacons. We only got two words into the sermon last week, right, on uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. But this is two words, deacons likewise. We looked at deacons as a humble servant, one who's willing to pick up weeds, walk amongst the dust. We set a baseline for all Christianity. If you're a follower of Jesus, God's call on your life is to serve him. That no one is exempt from serving God, but there are a special few deacons that God calls to lead out, to be spiritual leaders in their acts of service, to be lead servants who lead other servants. And we left off last week's message, who will those deacons be? And maybe some of you have thought to yourself, could I be a deacon? Could that be me? What's my road and path towards becoming one of those leaders within the church. Others of you might thought, oh, I wish I was there. I don't know if I meet the qualifications. And you're not sure if that will ever happen for you or how it will happen. You know, the road to ministry can be oftentimes a trying one, one that goes through many different obstacles, a refiner's fire. I know that for me personally, I didn't see my life playing out the way it did today. I had a very different plan. When I was 18 years old, I wanted to go to SBU, Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar, Missouri. I'd never heard of Bolivar before in my entire life. I didn't know where it was. I kind of knew where Missouri is. You know, I, I had an idea of where Missouri is. I know how to kind of experience things in life. And I thought, okay, my dad drove me out to SBU. Why would I pick a school like that? Well, because when I was 15, I knew I was called to ministry. I leveraged my life towards that call. And my youth pastor, Todd Cook, he went to SBU. And I think every other volunteer or leader or youth pastor that followed him in Albuquerque at a couple different churches here in town went to SBU. So it's only natural for me to think, if I'm going to be a pastor, well, it's in the Bible. I have to go to SBU. <laughs> and I remember having a great time with my dad. Driving on that nasty drive on I-40 all the way out to Oklahoma. Oh, my gosh. You get to Mount Amarillo, and it is the worst drive on the planet. I'm sorry. I love, I love Dallas Cowboys, but I don't love that road, okay? And I had some great talks with my dad about life, his history, his experiences, what he saw in me as a young man and a future pastor. And we checked out the school, and it was great, but it was very clear I didn't fit at 
Bulliver, Missouri. I didn't fit in there. And so God had a very different plan for us. That plan was to go to the University of New Mexico, to be a part of a college ministry. In fact, last service, I got to preach my very first sermon to a group of adults when I was 19 years old. And the pastor who gave me that privilege, uh, Joe Byers, he was here at 9 o'clock, really neat. I preached it in uh, Kirtland, New Mexico, northern New Mexico. The journey was that God had me at UNM, and that he was going to allow me to finally connect with my wife, to move from stealth dating to actual dating, right? <laughs> to go from friends to boyfriend, okay? And, and, and that God would allow me to be an intern at Hoffman Town Church, and then serve at Sagebrush as a youth pastor, and there were two long years of waiting for me. Two years of interning, and then two years as an official title of a minister, a youth pastor, until I was ordained. And in those two years, God was preparing me, cultivating me, teaching me, growing me. And the church was watching me to see if I met the qualifications. And some of you might feel that way this morning. You might feel a little bit like me. Like maybe I could be a deacon or my husband or my son could be a deacon at Anchor Church. Or that's something in store for you. You might wonder... When would that be? How would that take place? What is that going to look like? Well, the very first thing that we have to establish is qualifications for that. Do we qualify to serve in the office of ministry as a deacon? You know, God gives us two roles, two spiritual offices in the New Testament of leaders. The pastor the overseer, elder, the one who can teach. And we talked about those qualifications a few weeks ago. And then the role of a deacon, a leading servant who leads other servants. So we wonder, who fits that qualification? Is it me? Do I fit? Open up your Bibles to John chapter 12, if you have it, okay? It's going to be on the screen this morning. If you remember, this, the baseline that we established last week was a deacon is a humble servant. That all believers are called to that. The job of pastors and overseers of the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That we're all invited to help God expand the kingdom of God. To join him, rather, in his expansion of the kingdom of God. And so, in John chapter 12, Jesus is coming to the cross. He's already had his triumphal entry. He has made his entry into Jerusalem. He's been crowned the Hosanna, the Savior who is here to save us. And before he goes to the cross, there's some very clear words that he wants to say to his disciples, his followers, and to us today. And he is casting this vision about his life and the role of his life and what his life here on earth is meant to be. And in John chapter 12, Verse 20, it says, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Basidia and, uh, in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them this. He answers them by saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I've served my three years of earthly ministry here on earth have come. They're coming to an end. The 30 years before that of my life that I live here on earth, the hour has come. The moment has come. Why I have been sent here by my father is now. And these guys are excited. They want to be a part of that. They want to join in in that glory. Verse 24 says, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat and picture this. Unless Jesus dies on the cross and resurrects and ascends to heaven, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That grain of wheat to fall and die would be a seed that would be planted that can grow and produce an even greater fold. And it would be Jesus himself to say that He's got to leave. He's got to go to heaven because he is going to send his spirit. To which we can do far more 
That's an exciting invitation for Christians to join in and be a part of, to do more than what even Jesus could accomplish here on earth because we have the power of his presence in the form of his Holy Spirit living inside of us. I mean, that's something I want to be a part of. Verse 25 says, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He's setting up that baseline again of servant heart. It's like you are designed by God to live for God, not for yourself. To lose your life and capture and take on Christ's life. To let him be the decide, decider of your decision-making process. To, to him to lead your thoughts. To him to lead your actions. And in verse 26, it says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is the same grouping in the Greek New Testament of the word diakonos, deacon. But the amazing part about this passage of scripture is we see servant here listed three times, but those are different Greek words. Two different Greek words words. Jesus says, if anyone wants to diakoneo me, to serve me, he will be my diakonos, a servant. Now, English has a really hard time translating from the original language, the Greek, to express the full intent and meaning in our language. We're just, we're just deficient in that regard. We're a very precise, aggressive language, but we are not a very colorful language. And the Greek language has so many different words for different meanings. And right here is a great example. The word servant, a hundred different groupings here for just servant alone. And two are present here. This says diakoneo, to be a host, to be a servant of a friend. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have friends over for dinner, if I'm inviting guests over to come to my house, if they're going to be a part uh, of a special night together where I'm hosting them, I clean things I've never cleaned before in my entire life. <laughs> I'm getting brooms out, sweeping underneath couches that nobody can see. I'm cleaning under there anyway. I'm going to Smith's, and I'm looking, and I'm looking for the manager's special. Don't get me wrong, but I'm looking for that fine choice cut piece of meat that I can get at a discount. They don't got to know we're cooking it that night, right? I am preparing an ambiance for people to come over. I'm picking up one of the 9,000 toys that the grandparents have given to the children. <laughs> They're just throwing them in the closets. It's going to open up. It's going to flood out. It's going to take a kid out. It's going to be okay. Just keep the closet closed, toys behind closed doors. I am preparing an ambiance for people to come and be a part. We are putting on mood music. There's jazz playing on the Bluetooth. We've got candles that are being lit. We are not a candle family, but we've got a few candles for when guests come over, right? <laughs> now, at its baseline, some of us do this because we don't want anybody to think we're slobs, right? But I personally, I don't clean up for my community. But when we have guests over that have been over, I just want them to feel comfortable. I want them to have a nice time. I want them to not be distracted by toys or a mess. I just want them to come and hang out. I want to host them because they are my friend. In verse 26, it is saying, if anyone will host me as a friend. Or to take me on and serve me as a host would. Then he must be a servant. Not too long ago, I was talking with one of my friends, and he was in the entourage of Johnny Tapia. Like for real, for about three years of his life, he was an actual friend of Johnny Tapia. And I know Johnny Tapia's story, the famous New Mexico boxer, has got a long laundry list of redemption and struggles <laughs> and difficulty. But I really respect him for this issue because my friend's job as his friend was to be an attendant of Johnny Tapia, like a host, like a diaconeu. 
I was just looking at him like, you're a diaconeu. You don't even know it. His whole job was to keep women at bay. Women who wanted bodies signed by him. Women who were coming dressed scandally around him. His whole job, his friend's job, was to serve Dionysopia by keeping these girls at bay. Because he respected his wife. He didn't want to disrespect his wife in public that way. So that was his job. And I'm like, you're there to serve your friend, to host your friend. And Jesus says, if you want to serve me, you, you, you want to be my servant, you will minister as a deacon. You will serve in a humble way. There's no task too small for you. If you get asked by God to do something, you're willing and ready. A humble servant treats others better than themselves. Their time is available for God to be used. Maybe not in the capacity they envision themselves, but you know what? If there's a need, they're willing to serve. That's what a, a deacon does. And it could read like this. If anyone wants to be in my entourage, they must follow me. And where I am, they will be a deacon to me. They will serve follow me. That's what God's inviting deacons into. You want to you be in this special position. In Acts 6, we see that that special position, that somebody doesn't volunteer for that. That they don't show their list of qualifications and apply in that regard. That the, the body of Christ, in fact, raises them up. That they present them to the church. And the decision-making process happens after that about who will be a deacon. That's your first qualification. One that's willing to serve Jesus. Not just as a friend, but willing to do whatever he needs you to do. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's a few more qualifications. Let's read this together. You can turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and it says, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons. If they prove themselves Blameless, Their lives, wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's your list. Could that be me? Could that be someone I know? Could that be someone I see here at Anchor to serve in this manner? There's your list. And the first one starts off by saying, deacons must be dignified. <laughs> dignified. I will dignify deacon. <laughs> Tell me something. Have you used the word dignified in the last year when you talk about someone? <laughs> Do you describe the word dignified towards someone you know? That person just so dignified. I tell you what, they're being a dignified Christian, aren't they? Uh, we don't really say that, okay? You wonder, what does dignified really mean? Well, here's what it means. It means to worship, to live a lifestyle of worship. We're not talking about singing songs to Jesus, however, that's a part of worship. We're talking about moment by moment, day by day, you live a life of worship to God. There's consistent worship in your life. That how you respond in situations of life is worshipful. You see God. You fear God. You have an awe of God. You praise God. You seek to live your life and surrender to God. Our kids are going to public school. We've got Natalie, a kindergartner here at Dennis Chavez now. Natalie and Becca, both here. And I, I went to this elementary school. A lot of great memories here. Natalie's showing me her classroom today. She came out of Christian preschool. She's got a Christian teacher. We like that kind of bridge, right? Into public school. A little buffer for first grade. Hopefully she'll have a Christian teacher maybe then too. But 
We believe that our kids can be little missionaries here. They can love Jesus, shine for Jesus, and share Jesus, and learn and grow in this environment. And so for our family, that's not for all families, but for our family, that's where we feel God's leading us. And the thought about what they say and the words they hear at school runs through our minds. Right? What kind of words are they going to learn at school? <laughs> what are they going to come home and say when they're getting off the bus? Are they going to learn some new words? And they will. But we don't have a list of words they shouldn't say at our home. In fact, you might have some words on that list for yourself that you don't want our kids saying, but we don't really mind. <laughs> they're not bad words. Don't get me wrong. But we don't have a list of words we don't want our kids saying. In fact, we, we encourage our kids Hey, why don't you just listen to mommy and daddy? You listen to mommy and daddy, and if you don't hear us saying those words you're hearing at school, that's a really good sign to you that you shouldn't say those words. It's not saying don't do this. It's saying actually model our behavior. We live a worship-filled life. I, I hang out and spend time with a lot of people who don't know Jesus, who aren't pursuing Jesus, that don't talk like they know Jesus, and don't even pretend to. But sometimes... They will catch themselves. They will catch themselves cussing around Pastor Jerry, right? And I'm pretty down-to-earth, mellow, chill kind of a guy. Nothing really rattles me these days. I've heard it all and seen it all, but it always cracks me up when they go, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. You're a dignified man. I recognize that. I shouldn't have said those words. <laughs> No, they go, you know what, you're, you're different. You're a Christian. You're living a little different. You don't even say these words. I probably shouldn't say these words around you. My bad. You know, that's what it means to be dignified, to live a worshipful life. Uh, the next qualification here we see is to be double-tongued. You know, just plain and simple, don't be two-faced. This is a call to let your yes be yes, your no be no. Be a person of your word. To live consistently in all environments. I really struggled this early on as a Christian. You know, I would go to school, and if kids didn't know I was a Christian at school, I kind of mellowed, meshed, and blended in, and it might have been a surprise to some friends that I was a Christian because I walked the talk like a lot of them, and then I'd get around Christian folk, and then I'd just move right into speaking Christianese. And I kind of played that game. I, I navigated all the different compartments of my life differently. On the ball field, I acted different than I did at church, and you know, this idea of don't be two-faced. Be the same person. Be consistent. Don't be double-tongued. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be who you are that God has created you to be. And the next one is addicted to wine. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. Paul said a little wine is good for the stomach. Proverbs actually talks about discussing the drinking of wine. And so this is not actually a mandate or a call for no one to ever drink here. But this word addicted is to devote yourself to someone or something. In the Greek language, this means to give devotion to something. I wouldn't make it as a bartender because I don't know enough about all the different liquors that are out there. Alcohol, I mean, it's, you got to get a degree in it. Right? But there are some folks that I know that they have this sincere, dedicated devotion towards alcohol. I mean, it is a, it's, it's not just I ha casually have a beer or a glass of wine. This is an absolute consuming devotion for them. And for a deacon, one who serves Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, you're, you're sufficient for me. When life throws me curveballs, when obstacles come my way, I am not addicted to much wine because my devotion and my allegiance lies with you, not with alcohol. It's that same mindset that Ephesians talks about. It says, I don't get drunk on wine, but I'm filled with the Spirit because I allow the Holy Spirit to be the one in control of my life, my thinking, and my decision making. To not be devoted towards alcohol. And greedy is another qualification. Someone who's not greedy is one who is generous. They're sacrificial givers. They give to causes that are bigger than themselves and don't always advance their own kingdom. But they're givers who give to the kingdom of God, who jump in and help us 
build a church. Help us minister to the lost. Help us with tithes and offerings. Help us as a church to reach out to the homeless for our Yo Sandwich ministry or for or Walk for Life that's coming up in a few weeks where we're helping people fall in love with Jesus. They're sacrificial givers. Here's what they do. They give to good causes. The word greedy here is evil gain. Their money goes to evil endeavors. Where does your money go? Does it go to further good or does it go to further greed? Does it go to good or evil things? And this is this idea. Evil gain. It's, it's evil. I'm gonna, I'll be willing to collude with others in the marketplace. I'll lower my price and tell my friends or whoever I'm selling to that my price has been lowered, but I'm going to contract in a guy and ask him to raise his prices and we're going to split the profit so that everybody gets lined. That's, that's collusion. And am I going to skim? Am I going to cut short at work? Am I going to take the easy route so that I can get money? Blow past everybody else hoping that they're none the wiser. A deacon is also one with a clear conscience. Look at the verse with me, okay, because it's bigger than just clear conscience. It says in verse 9, they must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. This is a Christian who knows Jesus. They believe in Jesus. Their allegiance is to Jesus. And they are swayed by no other thought. Holding the faith, the mystery of the faith, with a clear conscience means that you are unsoiled or unpolluted. That you don't have anything mixing in, distorting your belief in Jesus. It's, it's one who says, you know what, I, I am not willing to compromise on 20% of my conscious faith in Jesus. I don't really like the things of God, and 80% of it's good with me, but the other 20%, I'm finding some mystical Buddhism to fill that role in my life. I'm not subscribing to the buffet of spirituality to find direction for my life. I go to Jesus as my source. A deacon is one who has a clear conscience on that, and they've got a clear conscience. Their mind has been made up, and their allegiance has been declared, and their actions and thoughts are the product of that. Not just a clear conscience. One who has been tested. Look at verse 10. It says, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves to be blameless. Let's jump right to blameless. Okay, remember, blameless is what we looked at for elders. To be accused of something and have the evidence of something that... If there was a trial, you would be found guilty for being a follower of Jesus. There's enough evidence in your life that you are a follower of Jesus. Or on the other side, to be blameless is that you are without accusation. That, yeah, that person's character is not uh, perfect, but it is predictable. So one who is blameless goes through a process of testing. You wonder how in the world does our church survive without having the official office of deacons in four and a half years? Some of you maybe came from a different tradition or background, and you're like, how in the world does a church exist with deacons? <laughs> maybe you had a bad experience. Well, how have we existed? Well, it's because we've got people like you who are the heart and soul of this church that have surrendered to Jesus or following Jesus and helping the mission of Anchor Church be established here. Seeing lives transformed by you. You're serving already. And these last four and a half years, you know, we've been watching. We've been watching you. <laughs> no, we've been watching. Because this is not a test that you fill in the blanks for. <laughs> There's no multiple choice questions here for becoming a deacon. This is, hey, is your life consistent over time, proven that you are a follower of Jesus? When struggles hit, when the curveballs of life Come, do you lean on Jesus or do you lean on something else? Do you lean on your own strategies or you pull up yourself by your bootstraps? Do you lean, are you dependent upon alcohol or drugs to get you through? What, what are you doing when the curveballs of life come your way? And that takes time to watch and see. 
And so for our church, as we present deacons, when we bring those names to the table, we will sit down and we will talk and we will look at the qualifications and we'll have an evaluation. There will be a backdrop of many years of experience for some of us. Others of us might feel like, gosh, I don't even meet any of those qualifications. You might dismiss yourself from that. Or you might feel that way about yourself, and you might want to dismiss yourself, but after going through time with us, you'll, you'll look and you'll go, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of just like them. And there's some faults in my life too, but gosh, I didn't see myself this way, but my life is predictable. My character is consistent because God is more concerned with the character of deacons than he is the product of their service. If he was concerned about the product of their service more than he was concerned about their character, there'd be some requirements like must have three years experience in mechanical engineering. <laughs> be able to build and support the church mechanically. Must be able to have his general contractor's license. Has three years experience sweeping and mopping. Right? These are all character qualifications that God is concerned about. And so that takes some time to look at. There will be some testing that takes place to establish that. Some of you might feel like, oh gosh, I'm just, I don't know if I'm there. There will also be training on what that looks like as a church. You can pray for us as we forge that and form that. Look what happens here, though, in verse 11. Did you guys catch what we read? There's a change here. It's the exact same break that happens in verse 8. We just got done talking about verses 1 through 7, qualifications for elders. And then he says, deacons likewise, in verse 7. Exact same break happens here. But it says this, their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderous, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. This break right here has led some scholars to be very polar opposite when it comes to where they land on what this passage of scripture is really saying. I mean, there are men that I love and respect that I have learned from, and there are scholars and writers that I read and listen to that they differ on this. And they differ because of this break. And they differ because of the original language. See, this break says, likewise, deacons, their wives, likewise. Some believe that this is a whole separate category for women. In fact, in the International Standard Version, it says their wives. But there is no actual Greek pronoun for the word there right here. Do you have another version in front of you other than what we use here at Anchor? It's okay if you do. If you do, your version might say women. Women likewise. Women likewise must be dignified. Same word dignified that's used in verse 8 about deacons. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, it talks about Phoebe, and it calls Phoebe a servant. It calls her a diakonos. It calls her one who is humbly serving her God. And some translations even translate that, deaconess. We look at Jesus who lifts up the place and role of women in society. The woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the women in his life that served him and followed him as a disciple. Mary, you see Martha, these, he cares for them. We've got Phoebe being called in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, a deaconess, a servant. If you've already forgotten, remember that's the baseline for all Christians. Uh, we're all required to be servants. We all qualify to be servants because of Christ in us. But many believe that this could be the role of deaconess based on several different factors. One, the break, likewise. Two, there is no formal verb or formal pronoun there in the Greek. Three, 
It doesn't translate to the word wives. It translates to the word women. Well, why did the ESV do that that way then? They believe that it's sandwiched in because of verse 12, that it's sandwiched in the role of deacons in their requirements, okay? So they believe that the author's intent was implied that it was talking about their wives. There's a case for that. But fourth, the fourth reason I see is because you notice there's no qualification for elders to have wives that are dignified, to have wives that are sober-minded. I guess pastor's wives, they get to party it up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to ask ourselves these questions in church. What's the future look like for us, right? Because we don't want to just fall into a trap of tradition, just honoring tradition for tradition's sake. Shouldn't we seek to simply honor Scripture? Follow what Scripture says. And so for me, I, as I read Scripture, we've gone through this series together. I've seen it's crystal clear. God the Father sent Jesus, His Son, Christ, to be the head of the church. He is the head. He is our leader. We follow Him. And in His submission to the Father, He's modeled to us our submission in leadership to him, that God puts in place men to be spiritual leaders in their home. Spiritual leaders in their home and spiritual leaders in the church. That the office of deacon and pastor, overseer, elder, that that is meant for men as spiritual leaders. But we cannot neglect and nor should we seek to minimize or dismiss or sweep under the rug the role of women in the church serving as deaconesses. That we should honor scripture in that regard. That there are, I tell you, there's women that I, that are at this church that run circles around some men here at this church in serving Jesus. Run circles. Women should be valued. They should be valued and honored in that. And they have some requirements as well. That they should be dignified worshipers. That they should not be slanderers, okay? Malicious gossips, using their words to attack and to slander others. That they should be those who are sober-minded, controlled, and not influenced by outside influences, but they're influenced by Jesus. They let Jesus lead their thinking. That they are also to be faithful in all things. Women, likewise, they've got that same call as deacons. To honor God with the character of their life as, as the deacons do. To honor God with the character of their life. To model elder life. Now it jumps in to verse 12. Right back at it. And it calls deacons. Those who are married and have a family. It says, let deacons each be the husband of one wife. Managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's an honor and an assurance for those who serve as deacons. And God has called some of us here in this room to be that role. And some of us feel like we've already been disqualified. And if God puts your name out there, let's talk about it. Let's test it. Let's examine. But I believe God's raising up men. He's raising up women. He's raising up you to serve the church so that the kingdom of God can advance, that we can multiply, that we can continue to grow. And there will be a time where we at the church, we just like we would ordain a pastor, We'll ordain these leaders in our church as deacons, men who are serving as lead servants, who are leading other servants. And there'll be those of us who support the mission and vision of Anchor Church by jumping on in. And we should honor those. And we should carefully, prayerfully seek out who those people are. Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you for your word. <laughs> And Lord, we thank you for your design for the church. And as a new church that is growing, 
that is making it past those critical markers of three years and five years. We're approaching that, Lord. And you're establishing this church and this community. We're seeing people come to know you. I'm excited about September 3rd where we've got people signed up to be baptized, to proclaim publicly their love for you. I'm excited to hear about marriages that are growing closer to each other because of their intimacy with you. I'm excited to hear about those who feel isolated and alone. They're finding hope and friendships here at Anchor Church, that they're finding purpose for their life and meaning beyond themselves. Lord, I'm excited for what we do and, Lord, what you've invited us to join you in doing. And God, that takes the role of deacon and pastors. Lord, as you forge our church, may we always follow you. Lord, may we honor you in that. May we hear from you. And we walk in obedience to that. God, would you raise up people that will make this massive difference here at Anchor and our church so that your kingdom can expand and we can join you in building Anchor Church here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, sometimes sermons are more controversial than others. This might not have been controversial at all for you. If in any way you said, you know what, I'd like to talk more about that, or you're like, you know what, I ain't never going back to that church ever again, <laughs> then that's probably a good time to talk to the pastor. I would lovingly care to have a conversation with you. So if you need more information or maybe you felt like you needed a little clarity on an issue, please take time to check with me, and I would really appreciate that. I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, we got big things. I said it, but like half of you weren't here for the announcements, okay? So we got the Isotopes game, the 27th. It's $5. Sign up today. Today's the last day. Yo Sandwich next Saturday, noon till 2.30. Uh, sandwiches making. We're making them till 1 o'clock. We'll take them out to homeless and the hungry and provide food. And then on the 26th, we've got the Walk for Life at uh, 9 o'clock at Hoffman Town Church. You can raise money up until that point. You can uh, make pay for me. You can donate to me how many miles I walk around the church or whatever. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Come be a part of that great ministry. Have an awesome week. We'll see you later.